The one thing that most people miss about investing in God's work, investing of self, of time, of treasures, is that God is no one's debtor. There is one kind of risk that is absolutely guaranteed never to fail. It is the risk of faith. That He's not going to owe you anything. That He's going to bless you beyond what you have done. Businessmen invest all the time in businesses. They have no guarantee. And yet very few people who truly, deliberately, intentionally, and willingly want to take that risk of faith. That is the risk of living generously. But this is one investment. When you make it in the kingdom of God, you have a guarantor who's going to give you the return more than you expect. This is the last in the five as we close this uh, series on generous living. And so we come full circle in episode five where you see Frank literally being transformed from tokenism to generosity, from duty to delight in serving, from moving from fulfilling an obligation to truly intentional generosity. He moves from thinking that he is the owner of what he's got to recognizing that he's only a manager of all the stewardship that God placed in his hand. And so with that introduction, let's watch episode five. But our top story this morning is of course Wall Street as the markets have been hammered since the opening bell. After a brief bounce, things are continuing to head south, leaving many wondering where the bottom will be. Alan, today is not the day to have trouble getting hold of you. Please give me a call back as soon as you get this. Hey, how you feeling? Hungry. Well, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> I think so. I'm gonna get something in a little bit. Where are you going? Ray's asked me to go down to the soup kitchen for a little bit to help out, and then I have got to run by the office and take care of some business. You and the kids have been down there quite a bit lately, haven't you? Look, no one's gonna blame you if you don't want to go back. No, I think it's great. I I'm looking forward to seeing everyone again. Yeah. Okay. Love you. Love you. Hey, remind me that I need to discuss some things with you when I get back, all right? Sure. Stock market killing you today. Oh, yeah, man. My 4167K is taking a beating. <laughs> I know that's true. <laughs> Donovan. Hey, sorry I'm late, Ray. What's all this? It's a beautiful day, Mr. Donovan. Can you feel the sunlight just streaming in? You mean uh, the sunlight coming through those holes in the ceiling? But not for long. Those grants we applied for came through. This place is getting new life. Oh, that is excellent news, Ray. I, you guys deserve this. That's not even the best part. Those men there are from Somerset Construction. I don't know if they're getting some kind of matching in dollars or what, but they're looking to hire as many folk from the kitchen as possible for the labor even off in training for certain positions. Well, let me know if they have room for a volunteer. I got a hammer. At least I think I got a hammer. <laughs> um, that market stuff that everybody's talking about, uh, how's that affecting you? Ray, I'm sorry, I gotta take this, it's urgent. Alan, hey. Yeah, it's urgent. Okay, can you come by the house a little bit later? Perfect, talk to you then. The general consensus seems to be relief that the day is over. The fear now is that the Asian markets will respond too strongly to today's sell-off, which could trigger a... Hey. Hey. Well, by the way, I've called Alan to come over here for a meeting. He's gonna come over a little bit later. There's some things that I want to go over with you first. Make sure we're on the same page. Okay. Your accident made a big impact on me. I remember sitting there just staring at you waiting for you to recover. I was powerless. I remember thinking to myself, everything that I tried to do to protect this family, everything. And you know what, it just felt silly. 
Ray mentioned something the other day. We were talking about the parable of the talents and how out of all the three servants who were asked to look over their master's money, the only one who was rebuked was the one who had buried the money and then returned it the same way he received it. The one that played it safe. I want to take risks. If God owns everything and we're willing to risk it all for him and it doesn't work out, well, it's just like moving money from one of his pockets to the other. It might mean a lot of changes, and that's why I have Alan coming over. So what do you think? I think uh, Ray's the best gardener we've ever had. <laughs> so how does all this market stuff going on affect what you've been thinking? What market stuff? Hey, Ray. Hi, Mr. Donovan. How you doing? Good. I just came by to um, reseed a couple of patches in the yard, and I wanted to give you a little present, <laughs> in case you couldn't find yours. Wow, this is a beauty. <laughs> you swing that in, right? Right. <laughs> How are things going uh, down there? You know, right after you left this morning, we got a call, um, said that there were uh, holes in the grant application, and they wouldn't even review it in, until we corrected it. Government. Yeah, right. Um, I was just trying to figure out how um, Somerset Construction could already be on site and they haven't even reviewed the grant application. I don't know. I guess you'll have to ask them. Well, that's the thing. I did. No one over there seemed to know anything about any grants. Strange. Hey, uh, I, I got a family meeting, so I got to run, too. Yeah, right. Uh, one thing um, I want to ask, um, doesn't your company own Somerset? Gosh, Ray, uh, uh, I got so much stuff on the plate right now, and I really don't want to talk business. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Thanks for the hammer, Ray. You're welcome, Mr. Donovan. Sorry about that, Alan. Uh, you were saying? So, I know how important security is to you, so I've prepared some ideas to fortify your portfolio in light of today's events. Maybe I wasn't that clear with you earlier today, Alan. We actually had some of our own ideas, as a family. Okay. Sure. Our goal is to increase liquidity across all areas. We want to start by dismantling our... Intentionally? Intentionally. Defective. Defective. Grand Trust. Grand Ma Trust. We'd like to have that charity discussion you suggested the other day. So what do you think? Can you help us out? When I heard the word from Frank's lips about risk, I'm going to take risks, and I thought about how literally every one of us, every day, take risks. Small risks, big risks, and they all varies, and we don't think about them because we do them almost automatically. Every time you step out of your door, you're taking a risk. <laughs> every time you get in the car, you take a risk, especially if I'm around. <laughs> uh, I mean, every time you get on a plane, it's you taking a risk. Every time you make an investment in the market is a risk. Um, and we all take risks. Often don't think about them. At any point, any of these risks could fail. And yet, there is one kind of risk that is absolutely guaranteed never to fail. It is the risk of faith, because it's guaranteed by the Lord himself. 
And yet very few people who truly, deliberately, intentionally, and willingly want to take that risk of faith. That is the risk of living generously. That is the risk of investing oneself in the work of God. That's the risk of sowing seeds generously so that it might produce a hundredfold. It's the risk of fulfilling God's purpose in your life and God's plan for your life. You see, risk analysis is about costs and results. And business people know this. They understand that. But faith risk is confident of the outcome. Uh, please listen. The degree of faith risk that you take is directly related to the level of your trust of the master. Amen? Christians increasingly want to play it safe. Increasingly, we want to play an armchair Christianity. We are continuously sitting back in our overstuffed pews in the church, warming them up and letting few take risks. Now, I want to submit to you that the spiritual couch potatoes are in greater danger than those who are out there taking risk of faith. Armchair Christianity may appear to be safe and secure, but it destroys us from the inside out. And then we could reach the point where we become cynical, critical, and skeptical. And Jesus tells us about such a man. This man who thought that the Christian faith is a spectator sport, this man who took the term spiritual couch potato to a new low level, not only belittling his stewardship, but he became cynical, critical, and skeptical of the master. I hope you already have turned with me to Matthew 25. And you remember in the video, it was this parable of the talent that Frank talking to Ray about it that gave him a whole new vision for life, vision for holy risk, vision for living generously, living for taking God at his word, vision for trusting in the promises of God, knowing that God will never allow faith risk to ever fail. I believe the Lord would teach us four things from this parable. First, the stewardship we have, the serving we do, the scrutiny that we will face, and finally, the surprise blessings that awaits us. Each one of us, every single person, young or old, rich or poor, we're all given a stewardship with your name written all over it. It does not belong to somebody else. Nobody else can use it. It is yours. God gave it to you with your name on it. Not two of us have the same stewardship. Could be members of the same family, have two different stewardships. All of us have been given a stewardship. All of the three servants were given different amounts. The first two who trusted in the word of the master, who took the word of the master seriously, who took him at his word, they were given two different amounts to invest. They return two different amounts. And yet, the thing that they both had in common is that they doubled whatever they were given. They doubled it. The stewardship we have. Secondly, the serving we do. These first two men represented true faithfulness, true faithfulness. And therefore, their serving was with great joy, not feeling of duty. It was not drudgery, but it was generous living. It was one of delight and joy. And they came back 
not feeling they had a burden or a chore to fulfill or a drudgery or sweating it out and saying, oh, I've got to be faithful. I'm going to try to be faithful. I've got to live generously. When I make it, I'll be generous. No, 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 no. You miss the point. It becomes second nature to you. And that is why each of them doubled the capital, doubled their investments. They both gave back equal amounts to what they received. They doubled it. The problem comes when you try to compare your stewardship with somebody else's. Don't compare your stewardship with another. And even then, the problem pales in approximation to what this third guy did. I mean, he spent his time complaining, grumbling, fussing, and fuming. <laughs> he spent his time complaining about the, the unfairness of the master and how unfair he was and why wasn't he given more, uh, what hard life he's got, and how bad things are. See, when Frank fully understood this parable of the talent, he joyfully rearranged his priorities. He was oblivious to what's happening in the market. That would have been different before the change take place. Hear me out on this one. If you are serving with whatever talent you have, whatever gifts you have, whatever stewardship you have, with, out of joy and a desire to maximize what your stewardship, it's a clear indication that you love God with all your heart, your mind, and soul. If your reaction is, well, you know, I, I can't do much, I don't have much, to, I don't have many gifts, and I, I can't accomplish anything, or I am just barely trying to keep my head above water, I got news for you. You're in danger of drowning if you start thinking that way. You're in danger of drowning. You see, the stewardship we all have, the serving we do, Thirdly, the scrutiny we will face. There's something here probably you may have missed, just in case I want to make sure you don't miss it. <laughs> in this parable, the Lord did not give them the exact time that the master is going to be away. He didn't say, look, you, you start working here, I'll be away for a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is. The time is not mentioned. The length of time he's away is not mentioned. Do you know why? Because it's irrelevant. <laughs> it's irrelevant. What is important to know is the day of reckoning is coming sooner or later. When the master said to the first two, well done, good and faithful servants, he was commending them for their attitude of generous living, not their performance. No. Performance belonged to the Pharisaic folks. But do you know why? Do you know why he was commending them for their attitude? Because had he were commending them for their performance, you know what he, what he would have said? Much done, good and faithful servant. Much done. No, 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 no. He doesn't say that at all. He said, Michael, how do you know that? Well, look at verse 23. Good and faithful. What's good and faithful? These are character traits. <laughs> Not something I do so that people can notice me and they say, oh, look at him or look at her. No. No. It is the attitude of the heart that the master was commending them for. Here's something that always boggles my mind every time, not only in this parable and in several others, as I read the Scriptures, I go through the Bible every year. The God of power and might, the God of the holy, righteous, almighty, all-powerful God of the universe is commending His servants. Weak as we are, imperfect as we are, and yet our attitude of faithfulness is commended by the master. Not only that, but I believe with all my heart, he is the one who gives us the power to be faithful. Amen. Without his power, I cannot do anything. And yet, he praises him for it. I have never found in the accounts of Jesus ever condemning anyone for a bad investment. 
only condemn them for no investment at all. (laughs) Think about that. Think about this as you read the accounts in the gospel. He never condemned anyone for bad investment, only for not making any investment at all. He gave these different talents to these three people, and when he gave it to them, he didn't say, oh, here you go, keep it to yourself, Uh, play it safe, Uh, don't take risks. Uh, He didn't say, sit on it, hello. No, he said, use it, invest it, grow it. (laughs) But here's something else about the third servant that you should not miss. This third servant does not represent the atheists and the agnostics and the reprobates. He does not. promise you, he does not. He recognized the master's ownership. He did not take it and spend it on immoral lifestyle. He did not even use it for selfish pursuits. Are you with me? He simply did not trust the master's word. He did not take him at his word. He did not trust in his promises. He disregarded his stewardship. This third man represents so many of our pew warmers in many a church today. They may enjoy the spiritual environment. They may enjoy the fellowship. They I even enjoy church attendance on occasions, and, and they may even be telling people with pride, I am a member of the X, Y, and Z church. These folks who are fellow travelers with Christians, in reality, they have never surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. If that represents anyone in this place or watching around the world right now, I want to plead with you, repent and repent now before it's too late. What distinguishes the first two from the third is that first two joyfully invested everything, everything. The five invested five and the two invested two, invested everything. The stewardship we have, the serving we do, the scrutiny we will face, the surprising blessings that awaits us. Over and over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus taught that in the visible church, there will be wheat and tares. In the visible church, there will be sheep and goats. In the visible church, there will be always the true, genuine believers, faithful believers, and the counterfeit ones. Oh, oh, I know, and you know that sometimes outwardly it's difficult to tell the difference. Uh, Outwardly, it may be difficult to distinguish between them outwardly. They may look alike, and outwardly they may even appear to be doing the same things. But those who are not true are unproductive. And here is a divine principle that you must never forget. It's a divine principle from the Word of God. Those who are counterfeit and refuse to repent are going to lose everything, everything. But those who are true, faithful stewards, are going to gain everything. A lot of people say, oh, it's unfair to take the one and give it to the one who had more. God is very fair. He's very just. And his word is a warning to all of us. Jesus said, anyone who leaves anything of value, anyone of value, even family members, for my sake and my kingdom's sake, not only going to be blessed in this life, but for eternity. Will you take God at his word? I think each of us, only you know deep down, if you're a joyful servant or just a religious consumer, only you know that. And I can tell you one thing. The words of this message can serve as a wake-up call to call some to repentance 
Turn to the Lord now while you can and begin to experience faithfulness and generous living. Or these very words of this message will serve as a testimony against you on the day of reckoning.